Welcome to the Russian Rulers Podcast, Episode 45, A Fragile Hold on Power. You may notice that today's podcast is being posted up a few days early. Well, this is because I'm going to be celebrating my daughter Tasha's 15th birthday, and I wanted to get this podcast out to you instead of delaying it, and that way I'll be free to uh, enjoy the weekend with my two daughters and have a good time with uh, the oldest one. So, let's get on to the podcast. Last week, we told the story of how Catherine took control of Russia, overthrowing her boorish husband. Aided by the Orloff brothers, the Empress had Peter sign a letter of abdication, which Frederick II commented that the Tsar was, quote, like a child sent to bed. Nikita Panin was now laying out the situation to Peter, who was groveling at his feet, crying and begging for mercy and the chance to see Catherine to plead his case personally. Panin, disgusted, said, quote, I consider it one of the greatest misfortunes of my life to have been obliged to see Peter at that moment. Peter was to be sent to the town of Rapsha, near St. Petersburg, under house arrest. He asked that his mistress, Elizabeth, be allowed to join him, which was quickly, and in no uncertain terms, rejected firmly. Peter sent numerous letters to Catherine, asking for better conditions of imprisonment. The Empress simply refused to respond. Instead, she carefully contemplated about what to do with her husband. As long as he was around, her legitimacy as sole ruler was threatened. Enemies of hers could use him to undermine any changes she wanted to implement. But killing him was simply out of the question. To solidify her lock on power, she appeared before the Senate on July 6, 1762, to present a second manifesto confirming her ascension to the throne and Peter's abdication. That evening, though, she was given a handwritten note which read, quote, Our little mother, merciful Empress, how can I explain, how describe what has happened? You will not believe your devoted servant, but I am telling you the truth, as if I stood before God. Little mother, I am ready to die, but I myself do not know how this terrible thing happened. We are lost if you do not pardon us. Little mother, he is no more. But none of us wished it, for how could we have dared to raise a hand against the emperor? And yet, Majesty, the terrible thing did happen. He had begun to quarrel with Prince Fyodor Baryatinsky during dinner, and before we were able to separate them, he was no more. We cannot even remember what we did, but all of us, to the last man, are wholly guilty and deserve the death sentence. Have pity on me, if only for the love of my brother. I have confessed my offense, and there is nothing more to say. Pardon us, or give us order that we be speedily put to death. I have a horror of the light of day. We have offended you, and we are all damned for all eternity. This note was written by Alexis Orlov. And this was not the news that Catherine wanted to hear. Now, there are conflicting stories of how she took the news. Some say she fainted, then cried, lamenting, My reputation is ruined. Never will posterity, posterity forgive me for this involuntary crime. Others claim that she actually did something that was just pure Catherine. She coolly issued another manifesto the next day, which read, quote, On the seventh day of our ascension to the throne of Russia, we were advised that former Tsar Peter III was again seized with his usual hemorrhoidal attacks and was suffering from a violent colic. Mindful of our Christian duty, we immediately ordered that he be provided with all necessary medical care. But, to our great sorrow, we received last evening the news 
that the will of God had put an end to his life. We have ordered his mortal remains to be transported to the Nevsky Monastery for internment. As Empress and Mother of the Empire, we invite all our loyal subjects, without resentment for the past, to bid a last farewell to his body and to offer ardent prayers to God for the salvation of his soul, while attributing the unexpected blow of his death to a decree of the Almighty who guides the destinies of our country in paths known only to his sacred will. Now, how Peter was murdered is one of history's great mysteries. What is known is that it was Alexis Orloff who did the deed. Some have theorized that the motivation for the crime was news that Peter was to be sent to the Schlüsselburg fortress, where he would be kept alive, and if that happened, Grigory Orloff would not be able to marry his lover Catherine. By killing Peter, Alexis believed his brother would eventually become emperor. This, though, was not to happen, as Catherine would never marry again. Her hold on power was tenuous. The military was on edge, as some wondered whether a male needed to be the head of the government after three females, Catherine I, Anna, and Elizabeth. There was always Ivan the Sixth who could be bought back. Foreign envoys, like the Prussian diplomat Solms, thought, quote, All it would take is one hothead. There is talk against the Empress that is so free, so dangerous, so unguarded. It is certain that the reign of the Empress Catherine, like that of the Emperor her husband, is destined to make only a brief appearance in the history of the world. What no one could have predicted was how hard and brilliantly Catherine worked at consolidating her power. She kept her enemies, like Count Mikhail Vorontsov, near her, as she had him stay as Chancellor, despite the fact that he had once tried to get rid of her. Those who helped her get into power, like Nikita Panin, was named the head of foreign affairs and was showered with money, as were many of the others close to Catherine. She also smartly made good with the church as she reversed, although only temporarily, the confiscation of church property. She dove into domestic affairs and was absolutely stunned at the lack of knowledge about her adopted country by the people around her. No one could tell her simple things about Russia, like how much money was being collected in taxes each year, or even more astonishing was the fact that no one knew how many cities there were in the country. Russia was crumbling because of the debt, and the military was grumbling because they hadn't been paid in months. What Catherine did to solve the monetary problem was brilliant, as it required a knowledge of her people and their view of their monarch to, put it, to pull it off. She decided to change the currency from a metal-based one to a paper one. As the Comte de Ségur wrote, quote, On coming here, one must leave behind the ideas one has formed of financial operations in other countries. In other European states, the sovereign has command over acts, but not over public opinion. Here, the sovereign controls opinion as well, and the multitude of banknotes, the certainty that no fund can reimburse them, the debasement of currency, which reduces gold and silver coins to only half their value, in a word, everything which in another state would lead to bankruptcy and the most disastrous revolutions, here not only fails to shake confidence, but has not the least effect upon it, and I am persuaded that the Empress could have had leather accepted here as money, if she so ordered. Her willpower was enough to make essentially worthless paper the currency of Russia. It is because of this that I believe this was the zenith of the powers of the Tsars of Russia, sort of like the Trajan of the Roman emperors. Others would follow Catherine with total autocratic power, but none had it in them to be able to pull something like this off, especially early in their reigns. This is an example of why she earned the moniker of the Great. What Catherine needed now 
was another event to legitimize her reign, a grand coronation in Moscow. The date set was September 27, 22nd, 1762. She arrived in the old capital on September 13th to begin the celebrations, which lasted for weeks, costing millions to put on. From the outset, there was party after party, balls, fireworks, and dinners, and she had to change her dress every single event. Catherine hated her time in Moscow, as the city represented everything old in Russia that both she and Peter the Great detested. As she put it, I do not like Moscow at all. Moscow is the seat of idleness. I have made it a rule, whenever I'm there, never to send for anyone, because it will not be until the following day that one has the answer whether the person is coming or not. Beyond that, the people there have before their eyes so many objects of fanaticism, so many miraculous images at every step, such a rabble of priests, so many monasteries, worshippers, beggars, thieves, useless servants in the houses. And what houses! How dirty they are, with their immense grounds and their courtyards that are nothing but mud holes. So there is a collection of riffraff of every kind who are always ready to oppose law and order, who since time immemorial turn into a riotous mob at the least trifle, who even cherish the tales of those riots and feed their minds upon them. There is not so much as a household that has forgotten its old password. In St. Petersburg, the people are more submissive, more polite, less superstitious, more accustomed to foreigners. But something else began to make Catherine even more nervous about being in, in Moscow. An overthrow or coup rumblings, centering, centering on bringing Ivan the Sixth back. The Empress decided it was time to pay a, pay a visit to her potential rival. By now, Ivan was 22 and had been known as prisoner number one for 20 years. He was mentally depleted and had little, if any, education. No one thought he could be anything but a figurehead, but hey, that's all they needed to take control of the country over a German princess. Even foreign diplomats knew that Ivan was alive and posed a threat. When Catherine saw Ivan, she said, Outside of a painful and almost unintelligible stammering, he was bereft of reason and human understanding. But his relationship to Peter the Great was there. He was a member of the House of Romanov, which was much more than what Catherine had. Because of this, she ordered a closer guard be kept on the prisoner with an explicit order, also given by Elizabeth and Peter the Third, that the guards, quote, kill the prisoner and let no man seize him alive, unquote. That is, if anyone tried to liberate him. Almost immediately on her return to Moscow, October 1762, a plot was uncovered that included 70 officers of the guard to overthrow Catherine and bring Ivan VI back. Instead of having the men tortured and executed, as was the style of the day, she simply had them banished. Then another plot was hatched, this time to kill the Orlov brothers to prevent Grigory from marrying Catherine and assuming the throne. Then, in a daring move, seemingly ill-timed, she saw that the treasury was not filling fast enough, so she reneged on the deal with the church and began the confiscation of much of their wealth. Archbishop Arsenius Matsevich went on a verbal rampage and brought up the martyr's name, Ivan, and asked the people to revolt and throw out Catherine. He was arrested, degraded, and sent to a cloister to serve a particularly hard sentence of work. The Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church was surprised by the Empress's actions and knew that they had met their match and, to, and agreed to the changes she proposed rather sheepishly. 
Catherine, upon returning to St. Petersburg, decided to get down to business. She invited Germans to come to Russia, giving them land to farm, hoping that their legendary work ethic would rub off on what she thought was the lazy Russian peasant. She also began laying the plans for an asylum for foundlings, a school for midwives and other liberal institutions. Peter the Great had westernized the face of Russia. Catherine was going after their soul. Then a crisis developed in Poland with the news of the death of King Augustus III. Catherine sent tens of thousands of troops to the border to bolster her choice as the new king. Her former lover, Stanislaus Poniatowski. Both France and Austria were sure to reject the selection, but neither did anything with the Russian bear on the border. On August 26, 1764, the Polish Diet elected Poniatowski king as Stanislaus Augustus. The Empress now had a strong ally on her western border now. At the same time, a plot was being hatched to free Ivan VI and proclaim him Tsar and take down Catherine. As I mentioned a few episodes prior, this failed attempt led to Ivan being mercifully killed by one of his guards. Catherine now had the blood of two former Tsars on her hand. Peter III and Ivan VI. Courts all over Europe were aghast by the news. But come on. Wouldn't any absolute ruler of the time do the same thing? I think so. Now there was only one other threat to Catherine, and that was her son, Paul. But there was no way that he was going to be dealt with in the same manner as Peter and Ivan. Still, he needed watching. Next week, we watch as Catherine expands her reforms, the nation of Poland is partitioned, and the fight with the Turks renews. Now, for this week in Russian history, for the week of April 17th through the 23rd. In 1605, Tsar Boris Gudunov of Russia died, precipitating the time of troubles. In 1729, the focus of this podcast, Catherine II of Russia, known as Catherine the Great, is born. We skip to 1870, where we have the birth of Vladimir Lenin, the Russian revolutionary. In 1881, another birth, Alexander Kerensky, the Russian politician and briefly the head of Russia. In 1912, Pravda, the voice of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, begins publication in St. Petersburg. That same year, Russian troops open fire on striking goldfield workers in the northeast of Siberia, killing at least 150. And finally, Boris Yeltsin, in 2007, the first president of the Russian Federation, died. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Don't forget to visit the website at russianrulers.podhoster.com or become a Facebook friend at Russian Rulers History Podcast. Leave a message, make a suggestion, or simply ask a question. And as always, das vidanya i spasiba bolshoya.